Hello everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at Birds of Prey, an ad astra game that basically features jet combat in the modern era, completely in 3D, with all different types of aircraft, and it purports to be extremely scientifically accurate, almost to a fault, but at the same time as I think a lot of what's really, really cool about the game is its scientific accuracy. So we're going to take a look at some of that in just a minute. So anyway, our situations are relatively straightforward here. Uh, we have our good old-fashioned F-100. This is Colt 1-1. He's uh, sitting on the ground. There's no runway underneath him or anything like that. So uh, we're going to go ahead and start by taking a look at a couple gaming conventions. And in this video, we're going to be studying how to calculate performance without getting too crazy with turns and things along those lines. So the key element that we want to think about here is uh, just how high off the ground we are. So in this game, because it simulates Earth with Earth gravity, Earth atmosphere, we're only going to be interested in traveling up to about 80,000 as the absolute maximum limit. So um, each one of these hexes is an interesting little shape. Uh, not only is it a hex, but it's actually a stacked hex in a different dimension. So basically, if you want to think about it another way, is each one of these hexes is about 400 feet wide, However, it's only 200 feet vertically. So that basically allows us to compress the vertical action down a little bit to make it a little bit more manageable. Speaking of altitudes, uh, to keep track of altitude, just like you do in other Ad Astra games, basically we have different markers to indicate different altitude steps. So as I was saying a minute ago, if you remember, a single altitude step is 200 feet. If I put myself with one of these little boxes underneath it like this, it would put us at an altitude of 200 feet above whatever is underneath it. This is usually above sea level. Obviously, this map was taken from somewhere out west, so chances are this is not sea level. This is probably up several thousand feet. So we probably would have already eaten ground already at that particular point. So at this particular case, let's go ahead and start at 25 altitude steps, which is going to put us at 5,000 feet. If I went ahead and added another one, it's going to be five. Uh, it's going to be a total of 50 altitude steps, which puts us at an altitude of 10,000 feet. So we're going to go ahead and park that right here. Now, a minute ago, I was saying something about you know, calculation of performance and things along those lines. Uh, what is that all about? Well, let's go take a look. So each one of the aircraft that you are going to be controlling in this game, with a couple exceptions for things like bombers that don't actually maneuver, have these little control cards that we can go ahead and utilize in order to figure out what they're doing, as well as you know be able to predict maneuvers, figure out where the enemy is relative, uh, calculate all sorts of stuff. A lot of this movement we'll deal with another day. Again, we're just going to be interested in looking at the nomographs today. So in our particular case, we have our Colt 1-1. He's basically facing this direction, and he's parallel with the ground. So if we were to think about that another way. Let's go ahead and pop up here and start throwing in some data. So the first thing we're going to be interested in, of course, is like everything, is we always like to go ahead and make some quick little comments as far as uh, what aircraft we're dealing with up here. We're going to have to make ourselves a little note of what quality uh, pilot that we are actually packing at this particular time. Uh, we have no departure points, no spinning, no G-effects, no fatigue, none of these kind of things. There's nobody else here. We're leaving initiative out. Uh, activity points, as um, you'll probably learn a little bit later on, are basically uh, how many points you have to go do certain activities during flight, such as tallying a target, firing a missile, anything like that. If you're a pilot quality one, you get a total of seven activity points. So I'm actually going to go down here and go ahead and block this one out. We can use these for different things. We can track our damage. We can track how many chaff and flare we fired, um, absolutely everything we can get, how many uh, turn points we carried, our pitch down turns, all those kind of things. So what we're interested in doing today is basically filling out this card for initial stats. And we're going to be using these nomographs in order to do so. So normally what you're going to do is you're going to go bring yourself over to one of these neat little cards here, which gives you all sorts of information about the given aircraft that you're going to be flying in this particular case. Now, most of the time, and I mean vast majority of the time, there are going to be given scenarios that you're going to be playing that give you all the stats that you need for a given moment. But for this particular case, we're just going to assume we're starting off basically from the beginning. So what are we interested in here? Well, the first thing we're going to be interested in is things like weight. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let me go ahead and scoot down here to the left. So you can see here, we need to keep track of all this information. And then we fill out this little, what they call the tax form, to basically calculate what that does to our speed, which in turn affects our movement in future turns. So let's go ahead and start from the top. 
What is our fuel points? Well, if we take a look at this particular aircraft, we can see that we have a total fuel points. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. We have a total of 81 fuel points if we are just carrying internal fuel. Those 81 fuel points are basically 8,100 pounds of fuel, if you want to kind of think about it a different sort of way. Um, since we're flying an F-100, we probably want to carry a couple extra fuel tanks with us. So we're going to go ahead and work that out at the same time. So we're going to start with 81 fuel points as our base. However, I'm going to carry two 275-gallon fuel points. So what is that going to mean for us? That's going to add 18 each fuel points. So if we go ahead and grab ourselves a calculator, that gets us 117 starting fuel points, which is uh, probably more than we need. I find in uh, this particular game, you almost never have changes in fuel because it's just not worth it. There's not going to be any afterburner carry. There's not going to be any dry carry. Now we look at our storage drag. What is storage drag? Well, these aircraft are basically rated for a certain amount of drag when they're not carrying anything. So in this particular case, since we opted to pick two of these 275 gallon fuel tanks, it means we're going to have to take this value of drag twice and compare it to how many drag point per storage point. What? Let's let me show you how to do it. Let's go ahead and grab our calculator again. So we know that we're carrying two of these. So that's going to be 12.5 times 2. That's going to be a total of 25 of these points down here. Now, we know that we add one drag per six. So all we have to do is divide by six. The rounding convention in this game is always conventional. It's in the nearest whole number. So that would give us an extra drag of four, which is pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and grab our storage drag. It's going to be positive four. I don't know how you could have a negative four there, but I always like to keep the sign. Uh, we have a spot for hex number uh, over here. We don't actually have hex numbers, which is really a shame. So we'll just pretend, um, I don't know, we'll call this hex uh, 1604, oh, let's call that. So let's call that hex location 1604. Oh, Wait, now it gets a little complicated. OK, so let's grab our handy dandy calculator again. So we know that our empty weight is going to be 2,638. We know that our internal fuel weight, if we're carrying a full tank, is 8085, which gives us a base weight of 28,723. Except, if you come down here, you'll remember that a full one of these tanks weighs 2050, and we're carrying two of them, which is going to give us a total 32,823 pound weight at takeoff. Keep in mind that in our scenario we're already in the air, but um, just for example here, we'll go ahead and use that as our example. 32,823. So we come down here and go 32,823. Your weight does change as you play this game because you can fire munitions, you can burn fuel, things along those lines. Now altitude we already know. We're not going to put in feet here, we're going to put in altitude units. So if you remember, we were at an altitude of 50 when we were in the other program. Now it's time to take a look at the nomographs. This is where things get a little complicated, but at the same time, I think it kind of gets fun. So you basically have a couple different flavors of uh, nomographs. You have this one, which is basically for calculating turns, and you have this one, which is basically for calculating base performance. We're going to start here. But before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and go down here and just make a note of how fast I'm going. We're going to assume that my speed is 400. It's a pretty safe speed to be cruising over the ground. All right, let's go see what happens. So we're going to go over to the performance calculation. The first thing we do is we calculate what our uh, estimated airspeed is. We're not interested in our indicator. We're basically trying to think of a better, easier way to explain it. If this is our true airspeed, we're going to be interested in basically our calculated airspeed is defined by what your air density and all those other factors were. Actually, temperature would matter here, but I'm not going to worry about that too, too much. So anyway, we're going to come down here. First thing we're going to do is grab our handy dandy line tool. Go ahead and uh, use blue for this, make it nice and simple to see. And we'll find the altitude that we're cruising at right now. So if you remember, our current altitude is 50. Then we simply draw a line to our speed over here on the right. So if our speed was 400, we'd come to this line right here. Then we simply let go. And that will go ahead and draw a line through our KEAS, which looks like it right now, I'm looking at 340, it looks like about 345 knots. Why do we care about that? Well, if we come down here and we draw a line from our altitude through our 345 knots, 
we can see that our Mach number is going to be something like 0.55. It's going to be kind of slow. The only thing we really care about on this part of this chart is whether we're in this region, this region, or this region. Because um, depending on what region we are is going to drastically affect our drag. So let's go ahead and scoot back over to our original sheet real quick and scribble this in. There are actually some wonderful tools out there that can actually do a lot of this automatically for you in spreadsheets that are available on the Birds of Prey groups.io file page. It's actually pretty cool. So now that we have this information, we can go ahead and uh, see what our load is and wing loading, things like that. So let's go over to wing loading. What's wing loading? That's basically a function of how much weight each square unit of area has to support on your aircraft. In our case, you can see we're about 32,823. If we were to scoot back over here, 32,823, remember we're going to round up for this, would go closest to a wing loading of 80 and a safe load of 6. So we're going to go ahead and come down here. So that's a wing loading of 80, which that's pretty high. And is also going to be giving us a nice little aerodynamic limit of 6 Gs. You'll see why this matters in a minute. So what do we do with that? Well. We're going to take that information now. We're going to scoot back over to that other nomograph. Now we're simply going to find our wing loading, and we're going to drag a line through this little line here to find where our Kias is. I told you it'd be important. So what did we say? It was about, I'm looking right out there, 345-ish. So it's going to be right in here. So where this line crosses here is called a Q mark. This is basically a relationship of how loaded your plane is aerodynamically at a given time. It's going to affect things like speed, it's going to affect drag, it's going to affect how much energy you use in a roll. It's really, it's quite impressive how much it's going to impact. Now, if you remember a second ago, we said that our safe load limit was going to be 6 G's based on our wing loading. Does that mean we can actually pull 6 G's? Well, that's where it gets a little interesting. If we were to go back to this particular thing, you'll notice here that you've got this little turn drag chart. And you'll also notice that you have a max lift of 12. This max lift is basically angle of attack. So if you imagine this is 0 angle of degrees angle of attack, this is 12 degrees angle of attack. Anything past here and you'd be pretty departed and not really in control of the plane. So our maximum lift is actually 12. So you're sitting there going, OK, well, what does that mean? Well, if we were to go here, grab our maximum lift, scoot through our Q mark, we would see that, believe it or not, if we were to use every bit of angle of attack we have, that would provide us with 6 Gs of turning potential which is actually very significant and also very, very convenient that our safe load in the load that we can actually manage happens to be the same number. If we were doing 450, for example, we can actually scoot back over there and go test that real fast. If we were doing 450, oh, let's see here, just run a quick example case. Okay, so we'll go ahead and switch our colors real quickly. If we were going, uh, let's say our da -da -da, 450 would be 450, 460, wing loading of 80, Maximum lift would be 12. There we are. You would see in this particular case, I was useless with the colors, that um, we would be able to pull 10 and a half Gs. However, our maximum safe structural limit would be down here at 6 Gs, which would basically result in uh, quite a bit of damage. And there's a special rule that you'd actually use to see how that would play out. So that's the basics when it comes to this little uh, NOMO tool, this basically calculating performance. We're going to come back to this in a minute to study engine output as well. So we'll just go ahead and scoot over to the other areas that we need to take a study of that. So our Mach number, we should just make a quick little note here. Our Mach is slow. So now in the beginning of the game, again, I'm just doing this so you can see how the performance is calculated. So now what we do at the, uh, towards the beginning, we go ahead and say what our engine output throttle is going to be. You could say military power, you could say dry power. And we can actually control how much speed our throttle setting gives us. If you come back to this sheet again, you'll notice at an altitude up to 7,000, because keep in mind we're over 5, uh, we're at 50 now, so that's going to round up. At afterburner, we get up to 9 thrust, and now uh, at dry, we get up to 5 thrust. This, by the way, is thrust loading more than its physical units of thrust, 
which is, like I said, kind of interesting how they play this out, but it works really, really well. So in this particular case, um, if we wanted to use dry, we could use anywhere from 1 to 5 of this thrust. If we were at afterburner, we could use anywhere to 1 to 9 of the afterburner. Keep in mind, however, that we'd be accumulating fuel points at that point, which would reduce our weight. And again, that's going to make things kind of complicated. We're just focusing on performance at this time. So speaking of performance, this right here is what basically we use to calculate our turn loading. So one of the ways that we kind of get started with this is we can go ahead and mark out what our maximum is and then go ahead and work backwards to calculate what we want to do. So in this particular case, let's say for example that we're sticking to what we have right here. We got that 345 Kias. Let's go ahead and find that real quickly. Oh, this is speed. So we're actually looking at 400 here. So we have that and we know that our turn G maximum is 6. What does that mean for us? that creates this thing called a T mark, which is basically a turn mark. It's a function of wing loading also. And that allows us to predict what we want to do as far as the performance of the turn. So for example, if we wanted to use all six of those Gs, we would have to then decide how long do we want to go ahead and pull those six Gs. Well, that's what this part down here is for. And you can see that each turn has got a total of 10 ticks, kind of increments or impulses or something like that. So if we wanted to pull six Gs for the entire turn length, we would come over here where it says 10, we'd pull a line through where that intersection is, and we go ahead and let go. That would accumulate a total of 21 turning points, which would give us a 90, almost, that's 100, that's almost a 110 degree turn, which is actually pretty significant for the amount of time that you're actually going to be using in that particular case. So, um, like you can see, that that's pretty cool. But let's say I only needed to make a 60 degree turn, that turn. Say, so, oh, okay, that's fine too. So we could do 60. And we could say, well, if we want to do it at 6 Gs, we could go ahead and uh, we need to use at least 6 segments to do that. But where people get clever is they say, well, I don't want to use 6 Gs. Uh, I'd rather use less than 6 Gs. What's the minimum you can do for me? Well, that's not bad. Because now we can just add segments to make our turn take longer. Let's say now we want to do 10. And then if we go ahead and grab our speed again and run it through this, we can see that we're only using three and a half G's for the entire length of the turn. So that's going to be a significantly less amount of energy that we're actually going to be using to execute that particular turn. So as you play this game, you're going to have a tendency to kind of zigzag back and forth between these two. So let's go ahead and scoot back over to our original little uh, platform here. So let's say we went ahead and decided to uh, turn the aircraft. You know, we want to use some of our aircraft. So um, let's go ahead and actually use the example we just did. Let me clean this up just a little bit here. Let's say that uh, we're still at 400. I'm going to go ahead and do that turn I was saying a minute ago. Again, I'm not going to update the fat or anything like that. Oop, this isn't going to work. So if I want to pull that off, that's actually not a viable maneuver. So let's go ahead and clean this up. So what is that going to do for me? That's going to mean it's going to take three and a half Gs. All right, so let's say we go ahead, and again, I'm going to be doing more of this stuff in a little bit of detail. We want to go ahead and pull three and a half Gs to get ourselves 60 degrees of change. Normally what you do is you'd roll first and then go. So we would have to sit here and go, well, how is that going to impact us as far as the rest of the game goes? So the first thing we do here, and again, I'm abbreviating a couple steps here just to make it a little bit simpler for me, is um, we're going to assume that we're pulling those three and a half Gs the entire turn. So that would mean our maximum load for this turn would be three and a half, and our average load, since we're doing the whole turn, would also be three and a half. So if we come down here, we can go ahead and say this is our average, our greatest, which is what we said it was, but that also means that our average load would also have been three and a half. If we had a straight segment during our turn, this number would be a little bit smaller. So um, now we go ahead and, like I say, I always like to kind of leave the delta speed for the engine alone. So let's go ahead and figure out what that would do to our speed. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to decide what the engine's contribution to speed is. Most players wait until the end before doing this. So um, in this particular case, I'm going to say, forget it, I'm just going to go for it. So if we scoot over here, we're going to assume we're at maximum dry thrust, which because we're at altitude 50 rounds to 70 would mean we get five thrusts. So what does that mean for us? That's pretty easy to calculate. We're going to scoot back to this one. And if we go ahead and find on the bottom line where five thrust is, we can drag a line through to where a wing loading is. 
and that's going to give us a speed change of plus 20 knots, right where this line crosses over. So we're just going to make a quick little note of that. So it's going to be plus 20. I know it has a little plus sign, but I'm goofy. So now we need to figure out what the stores and the form drag are. So let's scoot back to this. So we're at slow speed, so our normal form drag is going to be 6 plus 4 because we're carrying fuel tanks. So that's going to be a total of 10. I'm just going to leave this at a blank 10. So now we have to calculate what does that form do to our speed. So now we scoot back over here real quickly. Let's go ahead and get rid of that last line. I think it's just going to be a little distracting. So now we need to look on the inside and find form drag, which is right here. Now we take this form drag and we're going to drag it through our cue mark. See how clever that is? And then on this side, in the pink text, we'll determine what that does to our speed because of the drag of the airframe. In that case, if you look carefully, you can see that's going to knock 15 knots off of our speed. And this is before we get um, uh, serious. So now we need to figure out how much lift we used. What do you mean? Well, if you're pulling the nose upwards, you're creating more lift, which in turn is going to create more drag. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my line again. We know, OK, oh no, what do we do? How do we know how much lift we used? Ah, well, we don't know how much lift we used. We actually need to calculate that. If you remember, our greatest load used was 3.5 Gs. So if we find that, and simply drag a line through our cue mark straight across, that will tell us how much lift we used. In this case, we used seven total lift for that three and a half G turn. So it's actually pretty straightforward. So we used a total of seven. So now we need to find what our drag per G is. So if we scoot back over here, we can see at lift 7, angle of attack 7, we create 9 drag, which is actually quite a bit. So we're going to scoot down here. We're going to be doing 9. So now that we know everything, we can simply just do the math. So if we do 9 times 3.5, that'll give us a total of 31.5. gives a total load of 31.5. Now in this turn, we're just going to assume we didn't change any altitude, which means, of course, gravity is not going to affect our speed. So now we simply have to do the math. It's pretty straightforward. So if you could take a look, our speed added 20 engine. Our form took away 14. Our turn took away 31.5, which leaves us with a net speed of 25.5 negative, which would go to minus 26. So I do minus 26. So minus 26 from what? Our original speed of 400. Which means our new speed this turn would now be 374 knots. And that would be true air speed as opposed to indicated air speed. So you can see that when we took our invisible corner, which you can't actually see, that's gone ahead and reduced our speed to 374, which we then take, go up here, and then readjust. Now, for the sake of example, we'll go ahead and do that. So we'll go ahead and take that new speed of 374. We're going to go up here. We're going to adjust our speed down to 374. Now, let's talk about fuel points for a second here. Now, last turn, since we were at full afterburn, or not full afterburn, since we were at full dry thrust, we'd accumulate the number of fuel points equal to the amount of thrust we were using. So in this case, 65 fuel points are required to take away one total fuel point. So let's see here. So that would be five. So we just make ourselves just a little note that we've actually used five units of fuel so far. And that would be out of a maximum of 65. Once we've accumulated 65 of these dry carry points, we'd use one point of fuel, which would basically be the equivalent of 100 pounds, if you want to kind of think about it another way. So um, that fuel points has not changed. I mean, if you want to be extremely, extremely, extremely accurate, you could do something like that. Uh, minus a one. Uh, so technically, we are 116.92 fuel points right now, if you want it to be extremely precise, but we're not going to. So anyway, let's go ahead and work our way down through. 
So um, after last turn, we had 374 as our new speed. So we'd adjust that. Our weight does not change until we use up that fuel. So even though we're technically like nine pounds lighter, we're not actually going to represent that until we've used up a fuel point here. We need to use 65 of these dry carries in order to get that point. Afterburner carry is kept separate. One thing I will say this turn is I want to go afterburner. So anyway, let's go ahead and work everything out. We're going to assume we stayed at the same hex. I know it's not actually how this would work, but I'm just showing you an example. So our weight, we're assuming the same. Our altitude, we assume the same. The same. Wing load needs some change unless we use up some of those fuel. Our speed, we already adjusted. So now we need to go ahead and fly back here and go ahead and recalculate all of our good stuff. Go ahead and clean this all out real fast. All right, let's do it. So we know our altitude is still 50. We know that our speed now is 374 or so. So that would be pretty much right there, which is going to get us a Kia's of K -E -A -S. It's, uh, let's say 320. So let's scoot back down here real quickly. So it's going to drop us down to 320. Since this number is smaller than the number it was last time when we were already in the slow region, it's safe to assume that we're still in the slow region. Our safe loading does not change because our wing loading did not change. Our load limit, however, let's see what that does. So let's go ahead and calculate. Like I said, if we were to be extremely thorough, we could do one of these things and realize we're very, very, very slow. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. So anyway, our wing loading is still 80. But now our speed, if you recall, is only 374-ish, which is about right there, which makes our Q mark shift downwards. So since we know our maximum lift is 12, if we scoot through that Q mark, I've goofed up somewhere. Time to find out where it is. How could my safe load only be six? Safe load doesn't change. Let's see, is our wing loading, did I goof the wing loading up? Let's go ahead and see where I've made my mistake here. That's why it's always good to have more than one person. Wing loading is 80, speed is 320, that's why. Caught it, so that's not accurate at all. So my speed is actually 320. So I'm down here. 320, wing loading 80. Maximum lift is 12, scoot through the Q mark means our new greatest load possible, that looks closer to 5, is now going to be 5. So our aero load limit in this particular case is only going to be 5 Gs. So you can see that that little bit of energy we gave up in that 3.5 G turn has now made us even slower. So um, let's go ahead and uh, keep calculating, just to go for it. We'll go ahead and clean all these up as well. So now we're only going to be capable of taking a 5.5G turn. At least we know we can never damage the airframe with a, a 5G turn, I should say. Uh, we can't damage the airframe or anything like that. But that also means, if I were to grab this and go find our actual speed, which is now 375, which would be right here, um, that limits us considerably. Let's say we want to pull all five of those Gs. You know, what can we do with 5Gs? Looks like we can almost pull, yeah, we'll see if we can pull that. We can actually pull three. So you know what? We're going to use all five Gs this turn. So let's go ahead and come back here and update everything. That's going to get us three nose changes, but that's for another day. Let's scoot down here and go ahead and clean this up. We don't know what this value is yet. Uh, that value is not going to change. That value is not going to change. Lift use. Let's go ahead and clean this up real quick. We notice that we used 5Gs this time. We know that our average load naturally is also going to be 5Gs. Now let's go figure out what our lift used is. So if you remember, we used 5Gs for the entire segment. So that means if you go to 5Gs and you scoot scoot right through the Q mark, total lift is going to be 11.5, but that's going to round up to 12. Yikes, this is going to suck the energy right out of the plane. So that's going to be 12. Now if we go back to the card, 12 is 15 dpg. So now if we scoot down to fi and do 15, our average load was 5. Now if we go 15 times 5, that's 75 knots sucked out of the plane by that turn. So I'll do 75 knots. Uh, no change of altitude, nothing along those lines. Um, our engine speed. Ah, maybe we'll get some speed from our afterburner. We'll assume our afterburner was going full blast this time. So our afterburner at full blast will give us 9. So if we scoot back here and we go over to 9. Let's see. All right, what do we got? 
So, okay, so let's see, an afterburner of 9 right here. Through the Q, uh, not through the Q mark. Afterburner of 9. Let's see what that's going to do for us, real quickly. There we are, through 80. There we go. So, an afterburner of 9 is going to give us about, let's say, 38 speed, which is uh, not going to be terribly good, I don't think. 38. Also, since we're at full afterburner, we'd accumulate some fuel points for that as well. We'd be burning a total of nine of our afterburner points. Now, what you'll notice is your afterburner points are tracked separately from your dry points. So if I ran my afterburner for three turns, I'd already use uh, basically 100 pounds of fuel, or 1,000 pounds of fuel. Uh, 10, uh, 6, 100 pounds of fuel. Yeah. So basically, it's going to be nine. You track those separately, then you track the regular points. So let's scoot back up to the dippy top here. So that means our afterburner carry would be 9 out of 24. 24, 24. Cool. So let's go ahead and find out what that did to our speed. So let's grab our calculator. 38 minus 14 minus 75 minus 51. Wow. We definitely uh, suck some energy. Despite adding all that energy from our afterburner, we have literally drained this plane of everything. Obviously, our new speed is not 374. It's 374 minus 51, which has knocked us all the way down to 323 knots, which we then go ahead and load up here, resulting in a lower this, resulting in a lower arrow load limit. All right, so hopefully that makes it clear as far as kind of how to use the nomographs and things like that. They're not the most confusing things once you kind of work through them just a little bit. And um, in case you're curious, if you were ever doing a turn, again, I'll save this for a day when we actually do turning. If you are doing a turn, then what's going to actually happen is there's a possibility of carrying points over from previous turns, literally and figuratively. Um, that you'll be able to use towards your next turn and things like that. And the other thing I'll point out too is you don't have to use all 10 segments to make your turn. You know, you could do a quick snap turn at three, go straight, roll over, do a snap turn the other direction. There's really a lot of things you can do, but we'll cover that when we look at movement. Hopefully this uh, makes a little bit of sense. If you have any questions, ask. But other than that, enjoy.